Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India And welcome to Gender and Society. This is lecture number 11 and in this lecture we will be talking about gender and health. So um, we will start with a couple of basic questions that how is health understood and um, what are the various consequences of gender's impact on health and health care and vice versa. So. Um, here we will make an attempt to understand health as a sociological concept and um, you know what are the various ways we can understand um, you know health as and what are some of the um, important gendered aspects some of the um, you know impacts of gender um, that we see um, you know on health across societies. So, uh, we will start with um, an understanding of how we understand health and I will go with the um, World Health Organization's um, definition, a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So, what the WHO is um, proposing and very rightly so that um, to understand health we need to have this holistic idea um, that actually takes us beyond um, an understanding of disease uh, beyond the um, you know um, condition the the um, condition of the body of infirmity or or you know we need to keep in mind that there are these mental and social processes that constantly impact a person um, a person's health and um, that actually uh, gives a holistic idea of health of a person. So, if you look at the um, sociology of health, um, you will come across uh, you know an emerging idea um, that you know the idea of healthy living and um, this actually um, deals with um, the promotion of health at you know various geographic scales, local, regional, global levels and we see the involvement um, you know of NGOs of um, communities of um, organizations um, you know such as the UN the WHO um, to actually promote this idea this um, holistic idea of uh, you know health um, you know uh, globally and locally. So, the idea of um, healthy living is one of the emerging concepts um, in the sociology of health. Um, we also need to um, keep in mind that there are these public health policies um, uh, you know in recent times and um, we, we also you know need to consider what are some of the um, you know lifestyle choices that people make, some of the consumption patterns that people have and um, some of the risks that um, you know people take in society that directly or indirectly influence um, their um, health condition and that you know um, actually can be panned out um, on a uh, gender uh, spectrum. Uh, we also uh, need to look at um, how the sociology of health examines socio-political critiques of health promotion, the impact of both morbidity on social life and social life on morbidity. So, the relationship between you know um, how a person or a group of people chooses to have um, you know their social life and the relationship of that um, with morbidity um, needs to be looked at. So, we are talking about here is a um, again uh, you know an overall uh, holistic understanding of health which um, will bring into focus talking about family, talking about education, talking about religion, um, talking about economic standing of a person or a family or a group of people and um, we need to um, you know you know examine um, health and health care um, with a gender lens keeping these in mind. So, to understand uh, you know the WHO definition, we first have to understand that one of the um, earliest models 
to understand um, health of a person um, has been the biomedical model. So, the, what does the biomedical model say? Um, it says that disease is an organic condition. It, it has non-organic factors um, associated with it, um, with the human mind and it is considered unimportant and are ignored altogether. So, only pathological conditions are considered. So, the biomedical model really looks at disease um, as the uh, organic condition and does not really, you know, um, you know, um, bring in or, or examine the social cultural factors um, in the treatment of disease in the uh, classic biomedical model. Um, the classic biomedical model also talks about disease as a temporary organic state that can be eradicated, cured by medical intervention. So, if somebody has a disease, if there is a disease, it can be completely um, you know um, cured um, through medical intervention. Disease is experienced by a sick individual um, who then becomes the object of treatment. So, um, there is a whole deal of objectification going on here that a person um, you know the disease is the focus here not the person and um, you know um, it becomes um, an objective treatment. Disease is treated after the symptoms appear. Um, the application of medicine is a reactive healing process. So, um, the, the classic biomedical model um, talks about that its role starts only you know once the disease is um, felt, once the disease is seen, once the disease is visible and the application um, of the um, medical intervention, the medicine is a reactive healing process to that disease that appears. And disease is treated in a medical environment, a surgery or a hospital away from the site where the symptoms first appeared. So, um, you know, um, the person who has the disease is transported to a medical environment where, um, you know, um, the person is treated. Um, oftentimes, it is um, a hospital um, that, you know, um, the, 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 the symptoms are, uh, you know, examined and the disease is treated. So, this is in a nutshell how the classic biomedical model um, of um, understanding, um, you know, health looks like. But over time, what we have seen is that we have transitioned to the idea of the holistic model of health as we see with the um, WHO definition, where we um, consider that apart from the, um, you know, um, the body, there are these, um, you know, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, um, you know, um, occupational aspects in addition to the physical condition of the body that actually contributes to the health and well-being of a person. And, um, you know, more and more um, scholars are actually adopting this model, this holistic model to understand um, the, um, the idea of health for a person. So, um, at this point, I want you to, um, you know, keep in mind that the, we had these, you know, classic biological model and, and, and we have this emerging or, um, you know, now established uh, model of the holistic uh, model of health, which looks at um, uh, the body with respect to the social, cultural, um, you know, emotional, spiritual, um, all of those acting um, on the person. So, um, over time, we have seen that um, there has been some contemporary uh, transformations in conceptualizing health given the, um, you know, definitional journeys uh, that I just talked about. So, we see that uh, we have transitioned, um, you know, as a society or rather most societies have actually transitioned uh, from an understanding of disease to an understanding of health. So, now we do not really talk about, um, you know, in terms of disease as much as we talk about health. So, now we have, um, you know, transitioned or transitioning rather um, to an idea that, you know, you always need a medical environment um, such as a hospital to, um, we have transitioned to the idea of community. So, you know, community, uh, you know, living, community healthcare. So, we have, you know, transitioned to that idea. From acute to chronic, um, you know, we have shifted our focus from cure to prevention. So, now we are more concerned in terms of health 
to prevent you know not to be sick not to fall sick um, and unlike you know previously where you know a person can only be cured um, when you know you see symptoms of a disease from intervention to monitoring and uh, this is probably one of the most important transitions um, you know in healthcare practices that we um, see that no longer are we waiting for you know something to happen you know a disease or, or a bodily condition to happen but we are constantly monitoring um, you know our ourselves our everyday lives and um, this is one of the uh, major areas uh, where much of the emerging research um, um, on digital healthcare actually uh, is happening something that we will talk about um, in the next lecture um, but this is a you know a very very important transition that is happening um, you know currently we have transitioned from the um, idea of treatment to the idea of care so um, you know we uh, again um, you know um, we uh, again a preventive idea that uh, you know you don't have to necessarily treat some you know somebody after the person falls sick but you got to actually take care and you know probably prevent um, from falling sick and also we have transitioned from the idea of the patient to the person and this is the holistic um, you know journey that you know it's no longer the objectified patient but um, you know the um, the person who is influenced um, you know who has a bodily condition probably a disease or uh, symptoms of um, you know disease and um, you know that person is as much influenced by the socio cultural um, economic um, you know spiritual psychological factors um, as with the um, anatomical conditions so uh, you know these are some of the key uh, you know concept the conceptual transitions that we see in this study of healthcare so where do we see gender you know coming in here and you know um, gender has always been um, there at the discussion of um, uh, you know health and healthcare but here we want to you know use that um, lens a little more um, you know solidly to see um, how gender actually um, you know influences or how what has gender got to do with um, this so one way of looking at uh, you know the uh, the relationship between gender and health um, is to understand the transition from the homemaker breadwinner model so um, remember in um, the one of the previous uh, lectures I talked about the homemaker breadwinner model where um, you know we understood the separation of spheres and you know women um, where you know the, the, the home was considered to be the women's sphere and the um, outside world was considered to be the men's sphere and the homemaker breadwinner model um, of informal and formal labor arrangements. Um, so, as societies have transitioned from that homemaker breadwinner model, um, you know the health conditions and the um, the uh, the factors affecting health of a person has changed over time. So we need to keep in mind that this transition of that model actually um, you know goes a long way to um, you know have an influence on health, and also the theories that have um, been used to conceptualize gender the emphasis um, actually lies on understanding the lived experiences of both women and men so um, over time we have seen that these um, you know theoretical um, journeys to understand um, uh, or to conceptualize gender actually has been um, you know to understand the lived experiences of both um, women and men in society. So here I want you um, uh, you know to focus on the World Health Organization's um, gender policy and this was um, you know put forward in 2002 where the WHO uh, says society prescribes to women and men different roles in different social contexts. There are also differences in the opportunities and resources available to women and men and in their ability to make decisions and exercise human rights including those related to protecting health and seeking care in case of ill health. Gender roles and unequal gender relations interact with other social and economic variables resulting in different and sometimes inequitable patterns of exposure to health risk and 
in differential access to and utilization of health information, care and services. These differences in turn have clear impact on health outcomes. Evidence documenting the multiple connections between gender and health is rapidly growing. So, you see that um, in this uh, you know, view that the WHO puts forward, they have not only identified that you know, men and women have different roles um, you know, in society given different social contexts, but they have also identified that there is a difference in um, access and allocation of resources for um, women and men in any given society. So, and seeking health care or having access to health care is one such resource that is oftentimes not um, you know, available to men and women um, equally or, or, or um, as required. And um, the WHO has actually pointed that out that um, you know, these, um, these differential access to resources or, or, or allotment of resources to um, men and women differently will have impact on health outcomes. So, they have also talked about the you know the various research you know that's ongoing and that's emerging um, that you know the connection between health and gender is actually um, you know cannot be ignored it, it is actually um, you know there are multiple connections that we need to be mindful of so with that uh, we need to look at then what is the who's gender policy so they have a well crafted um, you know gender policy that um, the who um, will as a matter of policy and good public health practice integrate gender considerations in all facets of its work so they make it very very you know loud and clear that it is a policy that matters and um, you know it is a policy that will be integrated um, in all its um, facets of work they also say that integration of gender considerations that is gender mainstreaming must become standard practice in all policies and programs so the the you know point out very, very sharply, very, very boldly that, um, you know, gender mainstreaming is something that cannot be ignored, um, you know. So, you have to, uh, you know, bring in gender to the core. So, gender cannot remain on the periphery um, anymore and it must become standard practice um, in all policies, in all programs um, for organizations and governments. And they further say that all programs will be expected to collect disaggregated data by sex, review and reflect on the gender aspects of their respective areas of work and initiate work to develop content specific materials. So, they not only say, they not only you know point out the need um, of the hour, the need to actually um, mainstream gender in these um, conversations and these discussions, but they actually, you know, um, provide a, a way to do that, a process to do that, that all programs um, will have to collect a particular type of data. They have to, you know, design um, their data collection in a way that, you know, all of these are reflected and analyzed um, in, in, a, in a, a particular manner just to bring, um, you know, gender to the core of this conversation. So, just to give you um, an idea how the United Nations um, uh, Millennium Development Goals uh, look like in this respect, um, you, as you can see that um, you know they, they have um, you know eight goals and um, you know of which much of it is actually invested in understanding um, you know gender and health. For example, the first two um, talk about hunger and poverty, um, eradication of extreme hunger and poverty, achieving universal primary education. Goal 3, um, look at goal 3, they promote gender equality and empower women. So, goal 3 talks about you know directly talks about promoting um, gender equality. Uh, goal 4 directly talks about reducing child mortality. 
Goal 5 directly talks about improving maternal health. Goal 6 directly talks about combating HIV, AIDS, malaria and other diseases. So, you know, the United Nations also has, um, you know, found that gender mainstreaming in this respect is, um, you know, absolutely cannot be ignored. And um, this is um, not just ignored, but, um, you know, it has to remain at the center of um, discussions and debates um, um, with in this respect. So, now, um, let us look at then what are um, some of the factors, some of the interconnected factors that determine an individual's health status. And um, some of these determinants actually include um, personal features, social status, culture, environment, educational attainment, health behaviors childhood development, access to care and government policy. So, you see that there is this very complex network of um, you know several of these factors that actually influence that actually determine um, a person's health status. And we have something called the social determinants of health as you can see um, in the second point that you know uh, these points are also you know socially determined they some of them are social constructs um, and um, they are often socially determined and so the, these are also you know um, noted as the social determinants of health so now let's look at some of the uh, what are some of the social determinants of health or how does it you know pan out in the larger society so one of the first um, points for us to start here is uh, people judge their health in relation to others. So, um, you know, you will see consider yourself or consider, you know, somebody you know well, um, you know, how often do you think that, you know, you are fine or you are not feeling well or, you know, your, your health status with respect to another person. And this actually um, is not just true on the individual scale, but it can also, you know, happen um, at a larger scale uh, for a community with respect to another community, um, for a society with respect to another society. So, this, you know, comparing your health in relation to others um, is a constant um, comparison that people do uh, in society to understand how good or how bad um, they are in society. People often equate health with morality. So, um, think of examples, think of events, think of situations which can, you know, affect a person's health um, and, you know, it can be linked to ideas of morality. So, um, you know, people usually tend to, you know, um, follow a path where this morality is not questioned. So, they will not, you know, indulge in behavior or not do certain um, health related activities uh, when um, morality is questioned. And so, people often actually equate health with morality. The third point here is cultural standards of health change over time. So, what it meant, you know, for example, to be eating healthy, you know, uh, you know, 10 years back or 20 years back in a given society may shift over time to an understanding of eating, uh, you know, healthy um, in a current um, time and space. So, the cultural standards of, you know, health actually change over time. The fourth factor is health and living standards are interrelated. So, um, if your living standards are, you know, reasonable or fairly good, then your health is, you know, expected to be, you know, good. But um, if your living standards are, you know, not um, up to the mark or not that well, then it will have or it may have an impact on um, the health issues. And finally, health relates to social inequality. So, how healthy you are is also defined or also decided 
by your position in society and you know which social rank or which uh, you know social order which uh, you know um, um, the social location social position are you occupying in society so you know health in society can be judged can be um, understood by looking at these um, several factors here you see some of the key determinants of health from um, um, a public, the public health agency of um, Canada, and actually you can see that you know some of the uh, you know policies and interventions um, on health actually um, you know relate to um, various scales, and starting with the individual um, scale where you um, you know have the genetic makeup, the sex of the body, age of the person, and it goes to scaling up to you know governance policies um, and including. Um, you know the physical environment um, including water sanitation and pollution so and uh, you see and, and, and these uh, you know scales actually go um, all the way from um, the individual to the local to the government to the environment social environment um, and you see the soci socio um, environmental factors um, the socioeconomic status, education, social capital, culture, gender norms. So all of that actually, um, you know, in a very uh, holistic manner, um, determine um, uh, the health of a person. And um, you know, several of these policies and interventions are designed or crafted um, around this holistic understanding. So, if we take a look at the 2015 Millennium Development Goal Report, uh, then we will see that um, since the 1990, um, the number of people living in extreme poverty has declined by more than half. And this is, um, you know, th this Millennium Goal, uh, Development Goal Report actually says that this has been, you know, a quite significant progress from historical trends. Um, the proportion of undernourished people in the developing regions has fallen by almost half. The primary school enrollment rate in the developing regions has reached 91 percent. Many more girls are now in school compared to 15 years ago. Remarkable gains have been made in the fight against HIV, AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis. The under 5 mortality rate has declined by more than half and maternal mortality is down 45 percent worldwide. The target of halving the population, the proportion of population who lack access to improved sources of water was also met. So, you see that um, you know the journey that um, you know these uh, this go this um, you know uh, the policies had um, was to address some of these very important um, gender related health issues such as um, maternal mortality, such as HIV AIDS, um, such as you know um, girls enrollment in um, schools, which is a huge um, you know health issue, um, and uh, you know. Um, so, they have actually paid attention to some of these very, very central problems, very, very central issues that, um, you know, that had been um, plaguing societies um, uh, and um, need to be addressed. So, this point we need to clarify uh, two concepts uh, with regard to gender and health and health care. So, what do we understand by equality versus equity? So, just to clarify gender equality um, as you can see on um, the screen uh, means the absence of discrimination on the basis of a person's sex in opportunities in the allocation of resources or benefits or in access to services. So, you know complete absence of discrimination on the basis of any of these attributes. Gender equity on the other hand means fairness and justice in the distribution of benefits and responsibilities between women and men and often requires women specific projects and programs to end existing inequities. So, um, just to clarify that equality and equity, um, you know, they are conceptually, um, you know, different. And then when we talk of gender equity, particularly in terms of, um, you know, health and healthcare um, projects. Um, we see that um, you know there is a requirement of more women specific projects and programs um, to actually um, end the existing equities, inequities. Um, 
and um, you know this is one conceptual clarification I um, want you to have um, in order to have an understanding of health and gender. So now the question is um, you know whose health are we talking about and uh, again I bring in um, an understanding of the intersectionality approach the model of intersectionality here and um, we have seen that changes in the locus of care and burden of responsibility for um, you know health actually uh, is affected. The genetics, informatics, imaging and integration nanotechnology are redefining our understanding of the body health and disease. So we see um, you know technology uh, as we will see in the next lecture has um, you know very very important role to play um, for us. Um, you know remember um, earlier this lecture I talked about um, you know monitoring. So we are constantly monitoring ourselves um, you know through these gadgets through these um, you know apps and uh, you know that has um, you know redefined find our understanding of the body of health of disease. And health is no longer simply the domain of conventional medicine nor the clinic. So as um, of the um, you know the journey from the biomedical model to the holistic model, um, health no longer actually um, talks about um, conventional medicine only neither does it only talk about um, you know the clinic where somebody can be treated um, you know to good health but um, it actually talks about a much much broader um, you know understanding than that. So let us now look at um, some of the um, you know gendered consequences some of the Im influences um, the direct impacts that gender can have on women and men's um, life uh, with regard to health. So when we talk of women and life stages, uh, we fairly see you know these life stages into um, four or five stages and starting with the conception um, you know to adolescence, we see that there are certain practices, there are some processes, there are some social patterns, assumptions um, you know that are at play in societies that directly affect um, you know women and health. So the impact of sex selective abortion, inadequate health care, poor nutrition and um, you know child marriages. So these are some of the very very important um, you know patterns practices that we see um, that actually has a huge you know negative influence on um, women um, at an early stage right from conception to the adolescence um, phase. In the adolescence phase we see that um, you know women um, tend to you know girls tend to get affected by um, youth pregnancy. So if somebody becomes pregnant um, you know very very young or um, the sexually transmitted diseases or infectious diseases. So that is a health problem we see um, in the adolescence uh, stage for um, young women or girls. For the child bearing years we have this grave um, you know um, issue of maternal mortality and morbidity um, and that has you know um, you know continued um, to be acute in certain parts of um, the world um, you know as, as I talk. And the middle years um, of a woman's life which is usually you know a neglected period um, which is sandwiched somewhere between the youth and the old age that you know um, you know when you know some the woman has actually passed through you know the previous two or three stages um, the middle years are tend to be neglected for um, you know in a women's um, life and uh, it is uh, you know very um, in a sandwiched between the youth and the old age in a um, somewhat ignored manner. And finally the old age um, uh, one of the growing challenges in the old age um, is that women older women are facing um, who are living longer but not always better. So the assurance to live longer with a good health um, is um, you know um, the picture is looking very grim. So you know as you can see on the screen that um, you know these are the five uh, stages of life that um, you know um, a woman passes through and at each stage you see that there are these um, you know health um, factors these, um, these uh, processes that you know directly influence the health condition of a woman. 
So, I was talking about uh, maternal mortality and just to give you some uh, figures here in Africa you um, see a figure of 830 deaths per um, you know 100,000 births and the lifetime risk of maternal death is 1 in 16. So, it is actually you know very very high that you know a, a woman giving birth um, you know may face um, maternal death. So, um, compared to the wealthy countries um, where you know it is a um, it is an average um, of 24 deaths per 100,000 births and you have a lifetime risk of maternal death 1 in 2800. So, you see the difference in figures um, you know in Africa it is 1 in 16 and um, for the, um, the wealthy countries um, you have 1 in 2800. So, it is a huge you know difference in figure um, both in terms of uh, number of deaths per births per um, 100,000 births and lifetime risk for maternal death. And, um, it is seen that women in Africa are 175 times more likely to die than women in North America or Europe. So, you see the comparison the figures that you know um, the, the, the probability to die um, you know is so much higher um, in certain parts of the world um, than compared to um, some others. Now, infertility um, is um, you know such an acute problem um, in Africa that you know they have a belt um, you know a geographical belt as you can see on the screen that is called the infertility belt. And this infertility belt is um, in certain countries in central Africa as you can see where the infertility rates are as high as 30 percent as the chart shows. And the reasons for this are you know not clear, but um, you know scholars propose and you know uh, organizations who have studied these um, societies they propose malnutrition and high rates of sexually transmitted infections are probable factors. So, you know this is such an acute problem, acute you know health condition in certain parts of the world that there are social consequences, there are you know gender consequences um, because of that. So, now since we are talking about maternal mortality and then uh, we are talking about infertility, let us look at how research on biological conditions have actually um, progressed. Now, let us look at another grave um, issue around gender and health and in terms of violence against women. So, um, from various studies um, it is seen that the percentage of um, total murders committed by the opposite sex intimate partners as you can see on the um, chart on the um, bar graph that the percentage of all male all murders of men are you know really really low compared to the percentage of all murders of um, women. So, the increased risk of interpersonal violence or spousal abuse and sexual abuse um, in an intimate relation um, is a constant you know um, factor in terms of health and gender that we need to keep in mind that we need to study and that we need to understand that why something um, you know such as that happens um, you know uh, over um, um, a given time and space. So, why is that you know a risk of violence that we see um, you know constantly um, not just um, you know uh, at society at large, but also within intimate relations um, such as um, examples include spousal abuse. And in a multi country study it was shown that 23 percent to 49 percent of women have been physically abused by an intimate partner. So, um, you know this is a global pattern, it is a global um, you know uh, process that we see and um, you know um, it shows that just you know how the idea of gender idea of you know um, understanding what gender is can have you know grave consequences can have um, you know um, absolutely negative consequences um, even for intimate relations such as um, you know marriage or in the family. So, this is another area that we need to be mindful of when we talk about um, you know gender in terms of um, health and health care. 
The other um, you know area that we need to look at is um, so how have the understanding of men's health evolved um, you know over um, time. So this will require us to recall some of the ways um, where we have described masculinities, we have understood masculinities and how have you know such masculinities um, been related to health. So um, that understanding of the various ways masculinity is um, negotiated. How is gender constructed and embedded in social, economic and political contexts and institutions? So gender um, as we now well know that is constructed and embedded but that how um, is um, you know a work in progress and it evolves. So we need to understand exactly how are you know these gender relations um, such as you know the negotiations of masculinity um, negotiations of femininity are actually embedded in these social structures. How culture and subcultures influence how men develop their masculinities and how they respond to health issues. So we have with us um, or we bring with us these cultural understandings of how we define men, how we define women in society and with an understanding we also define masculinities and how those understanding actually respond uh, to health issues. So for men's health and masculinity um, we need to have a much much broader conceptualization of health, health behaviors and lifestyle choices, understanding lifestyle choices just as we need to understand um, you know women's health in terms of femininity and um, you know the um, the repercussions of that. So the idea of gender socialization, how, uh, the idea of how we you know grow up into um, being uh, you know women or men or you know how we learn our various social roles in society um, you know actually influence these um, you know dynamics. There are certain masculine ideologies that construct um, you know the, uh, the idea of being a man in society and these masculine ideologies go a long way in, in a very very important way to define um, a person's health condition in society. And to understand all of that, to understand you know in a holistic manner that you know who's which men's health are we talking about, um, we need to adopt an intersectional approach. We need to ask questions that which men are we talking about and we need to identify um, you know the various axis of differences that we talked about in previous lectures and we need to adopt that intersectional approach to understand um, the full story or at least um, you know part of that story. So we see that uh, from existing studies um, what emerge is that masculinity um, is an important influence on health behaviors especially for men um, although research on masculinity and women's health remains very sparse. So you know it is a it is a field that needs a lot more attention that it has gained um, and particularly with emerging ideas of um, you know um, the role of technology, the role of digital healthcare, the role of how we are redefining ourselves understanding of health. Um, you know this, this is an area that will be emerging and it needs a lot more attention um, to be studied. Um, but then at this point we need to um, be very clear that the constructions of masculinity actually influences um, the health behavior of a person. The health behaviors relating to diet, alcohol consumption, physical activity and smoking have been examined as modifiable determinants of health status and this was proposed um, in a study in 2011 and sex differences have been noted um, for these health behaviors. So 
again going back to you know lifestyle choices going back to um, you know lifestyle habits such as you know what sort of food do you e eat what sort of diet do you follow um, you know um, consumption of um, drugs and alcohol um, physical activity smoking so these are all um, you know attributes that go a long way to determine um, you know the gender identity of a person and uh, this has been put forward in a study to show that these are very important um, indicators um, that influence health behaviors. The idea that you know health seeking and emotional expression are coded as feminine and so many men prefer more action oriented coping styles. Um, this was proposed by Davis in 2000 which can include worse health behaviors such as alcohol consumption. So what happens is um, because you know society presumably labels such certain types of health behaviors um, such as you know um, if you seek um, you know more if you seek help or if you um, emotionally want to express yourself and these are coded to be feminine um, attributes um, you know men who want to subscribe to ideas of masculinity um, prefer you know go prefer to go a different route and they prefer to go a more action oriented coping style and oftentimes that those co coping styles actually take them to um, you know negative uh, parts and so um, you know it goes back the whole discussion actually goes back to the idea of the so social constructions of masculinity and femininity. So now we are faced with a question that how does the male gender preference affect the health of women. So we have seen that several studies have been done to actually find out um, that what are the social um, you know impacts what are the social connotations of um, male gender preference uh, in societies as we well know of um, affect the health of women. So we have seen that you know the studies propose that couples unable to control family composition tend to have higher numbers of children as they continue trying to have a male child and this is um, a quite common phenomena where um, families are unable to control um, you know um, the family size they and they do not have a male um, child at, at, at first they continue to have um, children until the time they have a male child. So, this is um, one of the major reasons that um, you know um, with respect to gender and um, family size that we see the cultural preference of, of, of a male child being privileged um, over a female child. We see that large families in low income countries um, girl, girls are less likely to receive health care, hospital care and adequate nutrition. So, um, if you have uh, you know very large families or if you have a lot of children and um, you your income does not support uh, you know a standard livelihood then, then chances are um, and it is uh, you know um, quite, a, quite a given the chances are that one of you know or, or a few of the children will be neglected and often times what is seen is that um, you know the preference goes to um, the male child or male children in the family and girls are less likely to receive health care or hospital care or even you know um, adequate basic nutrition. So, this is um, you know uh, put forward by a lot of um, studies. We do see that in industrialized countries mortality among female children is 20 percent lower than male children while in some countries such as um, China where small family sizes are mandated mortality among girls is 33 percent higher than boys. So, we see that um, in countries which do not have uh, you know um, a mandate of small family size um, or in industrialized countries that mortality among female children is 20 percent lower than male children. And um, you know countries such as China which you know um, had a small family po policy until um, you know a few years back um, mortality among girls um, is seen that it is 33 percent higher than boys. So, you see that directly how um, cultural preferences, government policies, um, you know um, social constructions, social um, um, 
um, you know norms beliefs um, actually go a long way you know and on and, and you're seeing that all these examples that they pan out to give us, you know, these various gender dynamics um, in society and here with respect to um, health. So now, um, so the question is, if gender inequalities give rise to inequities um, between men and women in health status. So, um, you know, we talked about inequality and um, inequity and, you know, we will consider here, um, let us look at a few examples, hypothetical cases um, and see, um, you know, what is um, one of the or a couple of the repercussions that societies which have, um, you know, gender inequality um, have on inequity between men and women in terms of health status. So, we see that there is a tendency not to provide minimum health care to women because norms in her community may prevent her from traveling alone to a clinic. So, you know, there are countless examples um, such as this. Um, this is a hypothetical case I am using, but there are countless cases where, um, you know, when women need basic um, healthcare attention, um, the minimum healthcare is denied just because, um, you know, she has to travel, she has to commute um, to the clinic and there is no one there to accompany her and therefore, you know, um, you know, it is just um, let go. So, um, something very basic, something very basic as minimum healthcare um, is, um, is not provided, is not, um, you know, um, accessed in this case. Um, we see that um, the social construction of masculinity puts young men or boys um, typically do high risk activities to prove their masculinity. So, um, imagine you know somebody you know that um, you know maybe a young man or a young um, you know a boy who has this idea of um, you know um, what it means to be masculine, what it means to be a man and um, engages in this high risk activities that may be threatening for health. So, just imagine if um, you know those ideas, those signifying factors, those signifiers around masculinity did not exist in society, would the person still engage in that you know high risk activity is the question to ask here. Um, for example, smoking as a masculine habit reflects in mortality rates due to lung cancer for men greater than women as it often marks a masculine behavior. So, you see that lifestyle, um, you know, um, habits um, such as smoking um, is attributed to as, um, you know, a masculine habit and therefore, um, you have the rates, um, the mortality rates due to lung cancer much higher for, um, you know, men than women because, um, you know, one of the major reasons being that this lifestyle, um, you know, habit is a marker of masculine behavior. So, as you can see that um, these are, you know, um, hypothetical cases, but they can actually translate and they, you know, often do translate to reality, um, you know, giving rise to um, these various, um, you know, um, patterns of um, health and health practices um, in, in terms of gender. So, if we look at, um, you know, South Asia and um, this is a study um, done by Fifteen Pasha in 2004, um, this actually, you know, goes hand in hand with um, what Amartya Sen um, in um, 1990 talked about and then what um, Ravinder Kaur and others have talked about um, recently. Um, is that the life advantage for girls and women in South Asia um, are um, quite grim and they actually, you know, talk um, about, um, you know, the negative um, consequences. So, the gender discrimination at each stage of the female life cycle, um, health disparity, sex selective abortions, neglect of girl children, reproductive mortality and poor access to health care for girls and women. So, um, you know, all of these are, you know, practices that directly, uh, you know, impact the life advantage of girls and women in South Asia. So, um, 
it is not just you know a gender discrimination at some level um, it is also the violation of fundamental human rights as we understand it um, and so um, they actually point out that policymakers program managers health professionals and human rights workers in south asia um, you know need to address health effects that gender plays out through the life cycle and organizations and policy workers and you know um, governments have taken up this role very seriously um, since um, you know the last uh, few years where again the gender mainstreaming is now um, not um, an option it's a requirement so as you can see that it is not just um, in terms of gender discrimination, but it also puts in questions of um, violation of fundamental human rights. So um, I want to conclude here with um, um, you know directing you to a couple of um, online resources that I want you to take a look. So if you go search for global burden of disease, it will take you to um, an interactive website where you will be able to see um, you know what sort of um, you know health patterns uh, are there globally, and it's a very nice interactive. Um, platform for you to look up um, how um, many of these um, you know health conditions um, pan out um, in terms of gender and then I also want you to go take a look um, um, on the documentary which is a PBS documentary um, it's called sick around the world and it shows that you know um, the healthcare practices the healthcare systems policies in five capitalist um, you know countries of the world so um, you know it will just give you a, a, a very good idea of um, what sort of healthcare practices are carried on um, in the um, capitalist nations and um, uh, a very nice um, comparative um, idea um, you know um, globally so to sum up, um, we have seen that um, you know the inequalities in access to healthcare present the single largest barrier to the health of women. So when we talk of you know the access and the you know um, access to healthcare and allocation of healthcare resources, um, it is a quite significant barrier for um, women. Across the world, women are less likely to have health insurance or to be able to afford care when they are ill. So this continues to be a problem where women are you know, less likely to have access to health insurance or um, they would be in a position to pay for um, you know, um, um, uh, a resource, uh, for a health care resource. Where biological sex differences interact with social determinants to define different needs for women and men in health, gender equity will require different treatment for women and men that is sensitive to these needs, which is that as long as we will continue to think about gender in terms of biological sex differences, then um, you know the idea of achieving a fair and just um, way for gender for health for all will require different treatment of women and men that is sensitive to these needs so it needs a completely you know different understanding a completely you know understanding that is you know that that you know is on a more holistic level social factors of discrimination should be considered for different and inequitable health outcomes which is you know something that we have talked about um, uh, in this um, lecture that we cannot ignore social factors um, that go a long way um, for towards discrimination uh, on the basis of um, gender and health equity will require policies that encourage equal outcomes including differential treatment to overcome historical discrimination which means that um, you know we need to think of policies at the um, you know local regional global levels um, which will encourage these um, equal outcomes um, and we need to overcome historically what has been um, discriminatory practices what has been violation of basic human rights um, um, to actually um, achieve health equity um, for all. So I want to conclude here with um, um, a question in mind for you that what have been some of the recent trends in health development 
with respect to gender in India and globally. So, um, you know, you can look up a few um, journal articles, a few readings. Um, if you want to read um, Emily Martin's The Woman in the Body, um, which is a cultural analysis of reproduction, um, or you can read up, um, and you can read up Leon Gordis, um, Gordis's epidemiology. Uh, so, um, look up, you know, these um, couple of readings um, and also look up a few journal articles if you can and see that what has been some of the recent trends um, in health development um, with respect to gender in India. And in the next lecture, we will continue talking about, um, you know, healthcare practices, particularly focusing on technology and gender. Thank you.